I know a lot of people, including myself, have been playing more video games like online or, or like multiplayer games that they can play with each other so that we, you know, we, we can like, you know, do stuff together since we can't really see each other in person. Like I look to see if there's an balance between those what I call high dopamine and low dopamine activities when I'm trying to assess whether somebody is gaming excessively. Hello, I'm Delaney Rustin. I'm a physician and filmmaker, and this is the Screenagers podcast, where we explore the complexities of growing up in the digital age and find ways to promote healthy screen time. For almost a decade, I've been researching solutions for families, including my own, because this is not easy. My films, Screenagers and Screenagers Next Chapter, show my struggles parenting around screen time issues, video games, social media, mental health challenges, and so much more. And I'm still on this journey with you and all the kids and teens in our lives. Today's episode is about video gaming. Video games provide plenty of entertainment. And now with COVID, so many young people have told me how happy they are that they have video games as a way to stay connected to their friends. But what are some of the concerns when playing video games for long stretches? And what are practical tips for parenting around video games? We explore these issues with Dr. Clifford Sussman, and we'll hear from Andrew, who was in Screenagers, getting help with excessive gaming. And you might be surprised to learn what he's doing now. But first, here is Ty again, the 15-year-old you heard at the start of the show. I really, really like a game. I think the longest I've ever gone, like, nonstop is probably, like, three hours. If I play for a longer time, then other things will seem boring or hard to focus, and I'll just be tired from, like, you know, playing the game and stuff. If a kid binges on games all weekend, they may not pay as well attention in school, and they may be more bored than they usually are. That's Dr. Clifford Sussman. I'm a gamer myself. Dr. Sussman is a child and adolescent psychiatrist who specializes in helping youth regain balance from tech overuse. It was never my idea to stop kids from gaming or from using screens. My goal is to help families and kids find more of a balance. Dr. Sussman co-wrote a review of the biology of the brain and video gaming. He's interested in how the reward system of the brain relates to how many hours of gaming can make other things feel more boring. Can you speak a little bit about research related to high use of video games and other screen activities and the reward system? Yeah, a lot of those brain changes are in the parts of the brain that are most associated with uh, the dopaminergic pathways, which is the reward system of the brain. Excessive use of anything that produces the heavy release of dopamine and continuous release of dopamine will cause changes in the brain, like downregulation of dopamine receptors. Downregulation of receptors, meaning less receptors. For dopamine to cause a pleasure feeling, it has to be taken up by receptors on a neuron. But if there starts to be lots and lots of dopamine, the neuron will make less receptors, so not to be flooded by dopamine. If you have fewer dopamine receptors, it's like you have fewer receptors for pleasure, and it's almost like being desensitized for pleasure. You feel more bored by everything. You feel worse at rest, like when you're not getting reward. I mean, I see it all the time in practice. Parents will report to me that my patients will be in a completely different state when they binge for hours on a game. They're just like a different person with a different personality. And most gamers who've binged for many hours in a row will will notice that when they get off, they're just irritable. They're not feeling quite right. It's like reward withdrawal, if you will. It seems like the only thing that will make them feel better is to get back on a game, but it doesn't quite make them feel as much better as they'd like. Dr. Sussman mentions brain imaging studies done with people who've experienced really problematic excessive video game use. They have done studies where they've taken people who game excessively and they've taken people who don't game excessively and they've compared the way their brains respond to different reward activities. 
Researchers use brain imaging devices called functional MRIs that show not just the structure of the brain, but also the activity of the brain in real time. They can show how there's significant differences in the brains of both groups and how there's much less response to dopamine and much less response to reward in the group that games excessively. Less response to rewards, less pleasure from everyday things. We don't want that for our kids. And from a brain perspective, what does Dr. Sussman think is excessive? I look to see if there's a balance between what I call high dopamine and low dopamine activities when I'm trying to assess whether somebody is using screens or gaming excessively. High dopamine activities and low dopamine activities. I'd never heard of anything discussed this way. What are some of the low dopamine activities that Dr. Sussman is referring to? I'm talking about activities like doing homework or even playing a sport or doing exercise or a board game. All those activities have more delayed gratification. And you can even do activities with delayed gratification on a screen. For example, using a word processor or using Photoshop editor. Those delays in gratification, even if they're subtle, even if it's just a few minutes here and there, that make a huge difference in how much the brain releases dopamine during that time that gives the brain a chance to upregulate those dopamine receptors. Studies suggest that with these low dopamine activities, the neurons can replenish their dopamine receptors, which is called upregulation. Can you say a little bit more about delayed gratification? Is, for example, when someone's doing their homework, is it that someday they'll, they'll, or in a few hours, they'll get it done? Or is Mm -hmm. it, or playing a board game, just that you're having fun, but it's just at a lower level? It's not the level of fun. It's more how long you're waiting to get a reward. Even doing an activity like playing a board game that's, let's say, entirely based on a video game and entirely based on some of the types of rewards you get in a video game, because a lot of board games now are wonderful because they're inspired by video game creators. The point is that you've got to set up the board, you've got to read the instructions, you have to wait for your turn. It's not all just coming at you continually. Baking is the perfect example. Even once you prepared the food, you have to wait for it to cook. And certainly has a great reward when you get to eat the food, but it has a like a pretty significant delay. So what does this mean for parenting video games? So what I say to parents, just so they have sort of a simple rule to go by, is that if their kid's on for, let's say, an hour, then the low dopamine activity should last at least that long before they're allowed to have another high dopamine block. So that means that if you've just been playing Fortnite for an hour, that, you know, whatever activity you do next needs to be low dopamine. So it could be, for example you know, doing exercise. That's not to say that we're talking about an hour a day. Remember, this is an hour at a time. So a teenager could have several hour long blocks in one day. They're just getting into the habit, the pattern of gaming for an hour at a time so that they can't get into these, you know, really long binges. do when a teen says, I want to be a professional video game player? And, you know, they have scholarships to college and whatnot. Well, I've actually worked with um, more than one patient who were professional gamers who had that with addiction or without, because you can actually be a professional gamer without being addicted to video games. I've even worked on some sort of training schedules for gamers that allow for more of a balance between on-screen and off-screen activities. I completely respect professional gaming as a sport. I get it. Mm -hmm. And so if a teen says, look, I'm really trying to be a professional, you're still going to screen for, okay, do you have healthy relationships? Are you still meeting other goals that you would have? Or is it truly just taking over And then that would be a red red flag. Right. And oftentimes it's not necessarily a good road for a kid to take. They may be using it as sort of an excuse to gain more, you know, or they may be in this fantasy world where they see it as a way for them to stay in their virtual world without having to be in the real world. You know, professional gaming looks like a nice sort of way out to them or sort of a shortcut to life.
competitive video gaming is becoming more socially acceptable. The problem is that to be really, really good at that, you have to give up a lot of other things. And most people will never be good enough to be in the top. That's Andrew, who experienced true video game addiction. I think there's an inherent need for people to have a sense of competency um, in anything. And for most gamers, you know, that's video games is their competency. And so a lot of people that I've seen have sort of destroyed their well-being over pursuing something that really got them nowhere. Andrew received treatment at a recovery center called Restart. And I filmed him for Screenagers when he was there. Um, my main thing was video games and, you know, internet use. Um, mm -hmm. Binge watching videos and crawling message boards and things like that. Now Andrew actually works at Restart. For three and a half years, he's been helping people there who are going through recovery. And he's the first graduate of the program to come on board as staff. What are the people that you um, help serve? What are they coming in for? The client base is always so diverse, um, but all of them had problems with playing too many video games. I don't know specifically um, a lot of the video games that they were playing. Um, I know a lot of them were binge watching shows and anime and things like that on top of playing a lot of video games. Um, I know some of them mentioned Fortnite. One of them mentioned Counter-Strike, uh, Global Offensive. It's a competitive first-person shooter, kind of like Call of Duty. What makes it a kind of a problem versus just teens who watch a lot? What are the signs or what do you see in people who makes you concerned? I think the biggest sign is that it's taking away from other aspects of someone's life in a significant way. Um, so, you know, watching shows occasionally is fine as long as you still have, you're still getting out and forming, you know, relationships and keeping yourself physically healthy and mentally healthy and you have good habits and you're pursuing um, something that gives you meaning or fulfillment. The problem is like all addictions, the binge watching or the playing video games or whatever it is becomes priority number one. It's pretty hard to have a balanced life when you're prioritizing um, watching shows or playing video games over having friends, working out, eating healthy, working, you know. So wonderfully stated. And, you know, just I have to tell you that every time in screenagers, people, teenagers, kids, young adults see you play the piano and to hear you say, you know, I often wonder how much better I would even be if I hadn't spent so much time playing games or being online. You just, you, you see it resonates with them and they start to really think for themselves that kind of decisions that we all have to make. But particularly when the, you know, that age where learning and self-identity are, are just so, so primed. We just don't want to lose that sense of self and confidence that comes from having a host of skills and experiences. Yeah. So I just want to thank you so much because that much more than any parent or me saying anything, you see them really start to, to contemplate. Oh yeah. <laughs> I got to think about that too. Yeah. I'm so glad that that's having a positive effect. I mean, that, that really justifies all the experiences I went through. Um, and that's really the main reason I was actually talking with the clients about this. Um, cause some of them were like, why do you still work here? And I said, the main reason is seeing other people come to the ex like same realizations that I did and start to make those positive changes and realize that they can have a real and lasting permanent effect on your life, um, and positive change in your life. That's why I continue to work there. Here's Ty again. If I'm not playing video game, I'm typically outside, you know, riding a skateboard or I'm playing baseball or I'm working out or I'm playing the guitar or at school or I'm reading. Those are the main like five, six things that I do when I'm not playing video games. And when it comes to parenting around video games, Dr. Sussman mentioned a few other pointers. Kids and, and even older kids lose track of real-world time when they're on a screen. 
we call it time distortion. In other words, um, you don't really realize how much time is passing in the real world. Visual timers are great. They make one called the time timer where you just turn a dial and you see a visual representation of how much time is remaining. It's kind of like a more modern version of an hourglass. If you have a consistent amount of time that you give your kid for their screen time, then usually they're expecting it when it's time to get off. And there's not as much of a power struggle when it's time to get off. It's so hard to have consistency around video gaming. With COVID-19 and with summer here, there's lots of ways to parent, and we're all going to do this the best we can. So this whole episode is so much about inspiring conversations between you and youth in your life, to talk about video gaming, people's experiences, and research. Today, Dr. Sussman shared one theory that scientists have about the brain and dopamine in trying to explain why longer stretches of video playing causes some people to feel more bored and restless afterwards. Of course, the brain science around video gaming and other screen time activities is still in its infancy, and we have a long way to go to really understand everything. What do your kids think about what Dr. Sussman talked about? Thanks for listening to the show. And at ScreenagersMovie.com, you can find more information and resources on what we covered today, as well as other episodes, and how you can see the Screenagers movies and sign up for my weekly blog called Tech Talk Tuesdays. What topics do you want covered in this podcast? Email me at Delaney at ScreenagersMovie.com. We would love your help to spread the news of this new show. And when you subscribe and rate it on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts, it truly helps people find it. And tell your friends. In coming episodes, I talk with teens about TikTok's takeover and hear their solutions, as well as I talk to some of my favorite parenting experts on issues like overcoming parent conflicts when it comes to screen time. I want to give a huge thank you to Dr. Clifford Sessman and Andrew and Ty for being on the show, but also letting us use their music. And thank you to my team, my co-producer, Lisa Tab, and our sound engineer, Chris Mann. I'm your host, Delaney Rustin, also the producer and editor of the Screenagers podcast, and I really look forward to our time together on the next episode.